Welcome to Press Coverage. I'm Theo Greminger, and at Press Coverage, we're trying to bring you sharp takes, actionable information, and we want to identify edges that can help you win in fantasy. And, uh, you know, a lot of people have it in the back of their mind that Super Bowl's over. I'm, I'm taking a little break. But then there's others who are in the streets. They're drafted in the underdog world. They're drafted in FFPC, and they're just trying to get ready, whether it's Dynasty, whether it's Redraft, whether it's staying sharp in best ball. I'm joined today by Josh Larkey, and Josh and I are going to attempt to develop our own top 24, sort of a way we think that the top 24 is going to go. We have some early ADP uh, on underdog that we're going to dive into, uh, but before we do anything, I first want to welcome Josh, not only to press coverage, but back into the Roto Underworld. Josh is going to be taking over the Dominator podcast. Uh, you've seen the Dominator before with Matt Kelly and Billy Muzio. Josh is going to have his own unique spin on the Dominator. We're so excited to have you back, Josh. Um, and I know that the Roto Underworld community always loves seeing you as a guest on my podcast, a guest with Matt Kelly. I think you did like a four-hour Mind of Mansion this summer. No joke, four hours. So, yeah, welcome back, man. This is awesome. Thanks, Theo. Yeah, I just want to let everyone know that's watching uh, this in video form. I will get a new background. Folks, I do not work for the 33rd team anymore. I'm sorry. This background is very cool. And it's uh, it's literally we're Theo and I were talking pre-show. It's one of those like trade show type things. So it's literally a stand. It's like twenty pounds. It's eight feet wide or something like that. It's absolutely crazy. I will get a new background shortly. I'm excited for the Dominator, Theo. I'm excited for this show. We're gonna go rapid fire with some of these takes, which is honestly one of my two favorite types. I think you either go in depth research or you just start rattling off quick hitting player takes to get people ready to draft. And I think that sometimes a quick hitting is the best way of going about it. When you start galaxy braining and overthinking things in fantasy football, like your first reaction is sometimes your best reaction. And I think a lot of times people get so caught up into the wisdom of crowds, looking and seeing where people are being drafted uh, in early ADP. And it sort of sticks in the back of their mind all off season long. And it's, it's incorrect, Josh. God, we get this thing wrong all the time. And the masses certainly get it wrong. I mean, we're talking about early February here. We've not had the NFL draft. We've not had free agency. The franchise tags are coming up right around the corner. Uh, so we're going to get a, like bombarded with information over the next few months. But we're going to go ahead and try to establish our early top 24. Josh, if you're ready to rock, I'm putting it on the big board. Let's rock. Okay, so I have uh, right now, this is underdog. And if any of you play underdog, you can just pull up the rankings and do the same exercise Josh and I are going to be uh, completing. And I'd like to point out for the uh, the underdog uh, people out there who like to look at my account balance, my account balance is low because I'm rocking drafts right now, guys. Don't worry about, don't worry about Theo's account balance. It's a low one today. But anyway, let's get after it, Josh. <laughs> I got Christian McCaffrey at the top. Like, we... We think that Christian McCaffrey will be the chalk 101 in PPR when we get to August, correct? Yes, I, I think he I think he will, and I think he should be. Okay, so we're going to move Christian McCaffrey to the 101. I agree with Josh. Billy Muzio is on this train, too. McCaffrey is the only running back who could give you a, you know 28 points per game season if it all goes well. We don't really need to talk too much about Christian McCaffrey. But I do think that there is a big d discussion about who should be the 102. Right now, C.D. Lamb is the current 102. He's the wide receiver one in underdog. Dynasty rankings, a lot of sites are moving him to wide receiver one in Dynasty. Uh, the, there's being some arguments for him being the 101 in redraft. Like This is as high of an enthusiasm level as we've ever seen for C.D. Lamb in an offseason. Uh, where are you at on your 102 and your thoughts on C.D.? Yeah, CD Lamb's a little tough to draft at 102. I'll, I'll take him there a few times. I don't want zero exposure to CD Lamb. I just don't think he's as good of a player as the the other receivers in that range. I think Justin Jefferson, Tyreek Hill, Jamar Chase are better receivers. The guy that I'll make a case for in terms of someone that just uh, destroys fantasy, we're just going to go right back to the well. I did this last year. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. I still think it can be Jamar Chase. T. Higgins so might leave in free agency. The, the Bengals' defense could be really bad again. They allowed a league-high 8.1 yards per pass attempt to opposing quarterbacks. We like shootout game environments. The first nine games of 2023 before Burrow got hurt in that 10th game, Chase was on pace for 187 targets, 130 catches, over 1,550 yards, nine touchdowns, 
And that was with Burrow struggling to start the season and Chase being under 40 yards in his first two games. I, I think the upside here is enormous. So I, I think he's the guy, especially when he's going as the consensus fifth player, that I'm going to have the most exposure to early on. I, I love it. And I think that I'm kind of with you because I think that the T. Higgins, like the writings on the wall, I think that the Bengals might not franchise tag him. They've left it very kind of open-ended here. I don't think they're going to extend him. They might not franchise tag him. And you bring up the 180 targets. Like Jamar Chase having a Michael Thomas type season where he gets like 170 plus targets would be in the realm of possibilities if there's no T. You also have the fact that it could be a backfield in transition. Joe Mixon could be a cut candidate. It could be a combination yes. of Chase Brown and a rookie. Uh, so you could have a, and Tyler Boyd also, Josh. Like you, I would think Tyler Boyd will take a hometown discount and remain a Bengal, but he's a free agent. The, it could be Jamar Chase with Yoshivas, whoever they draft, and a, like a transition running back. It could be Jamar Chase season. So let's let's be bullish. Let's go Jamar Chase here at the 102. Now, before we continue discussing C.D. Lamb, Tyree Kill, and Justin Jefferson, and I'm on Ross St. Brown for that matter, like we like all four of those guys. Yes, we're at the 103 here. Do we start making a case for Brees Hall here, or are you still very much set uh, at a wide receiver at 103? So, pretty much Brees Hall, Josh, we saw the incredible receiving upside for him, and we saw the elite usage where they were so inefficient running the ball, and Brees Hall continued to get the like peppered, peppered with targets, had a uh, an unbelievable year catching the ball. And then we see, like, in week 18, he gets 40 touches. It's insane. Brees Hall, for me, you can make a case mm. right here at the 103. If you want to keep going wide receiver, we could go there as well. Yeah, I don't really have a preference. Uh, the, the two guys that I'd like most right after this would probably be Jefferson and Brees Hall. With Justin Jefferson, he sneakily had the highest yards per game of his career this past season. He left week five after 70% of the snaps. He only played 18% of the snaps in week 14 when he returned. 70 plus 18 is 88. Let's call that a game. So really, rather than 10 games, he basically played nine games worth of snaps. If we turn his 2023 season from 10 games into nine games, the pace becomes 128 catches over 2,020 yards. That, that's pretty incredible. I think there's some pass volume concerns with <clears throat> whoever the, the Vikings quarterback could be if it's not Kirk Cousins. But with, with Hawkinson on the mend for a while with the ACL tear, I think Jefferson's interesting. The reason that I think Brees should be in this conversation, coming off the ACL tear, playing with three different backup quarterbacks, he led NFL running backs in games of 75 receiving yards and games of 175 rushing yards. The fact that he was putting up three elite receiving games and then had those two elite rushing games, both of which were the most, yeah, they're arbitrary cutoffs, but it also shows that he has big play upside, elite weekly upside, which is often what we want in a game like underdog. Again, coming off the ACL tear with a middling offensive line, backup quarterback play was a new guy each week. I, I think if anyone challenges McCaffrey for RB1 overall, assuming Aaron Rodgers is there, Brees Hall looks like he should definitely be the RB2. And I wouldn't even hate if someone tried to make a case for why Brees Hall should be the 101 for next year's fantasy drafts. Well, if you're an ageist, you know, or if you want somebody with sort of unknown upside, like Brees Hall still has a little bit of unknown upside because we haven't seen Brees Hall have a consistent quarterback next to him in his career. Like we've seen mm -hmm. these spike games, but, you know, there's a certain limitation in the offense you run when you have poor quarterback play in the NFL. It's proven time in, time out where, you know, teams will open up the playbook and get a little more creative and a little bit more aggressive. And with Aaron Rodgers, I think they'll have that. Um, you know, again, Rodgers missed a ton of time, but he's still better than anything Brees Hall's ever played with. So we'll let, Josh, do you want to go positional scarcity here and push Brees Hall at the 103, or should we keep Jefferson and go Hall at the four? Let's, let's go Jefferson three, Hall four. We'll still get the clicks. People will still be surprised by Brees Hall being ahead of Lamb, ahead of Hill. And uh, then we don't have to not get some Justin Jefferson exposure. Okay, so we're down to the work. To recap, it's McCaffrey, Chase, Jefferson, Hall. That's our one through four. We're at 105. Okay, so Tyree Kill had, was on pace for 2,000 yards, played fantastic, had a sort of a, 
uh, a disappointing end of the season. When you had him on your fantasy team through the first eight weeks, it looked like you were going to coast to titles. There weren't a whole lot of Tyree Kill teams uh, in the major cash. C.D. Lamb, wide receiver one overall. Again, you're a little bit lower on him than consensus. And then I will throw Amon Ross St. Brown also into the mix here for our 105, about as insulated as it gets. Air yards, targets, yardage, receptions, touchdowns. Amon Ross St. Brown hit hit big milestones uh, that we wanted to see, and he's still very young and a great offense. Where do you want to go here with the 105? Make your case. I uh, This is where I start to have fewer exciting takes. Uh, Tyreek Hill, he's going to be 30 years old. We, we, we don't really like that. But at the same time, we've had so many seasons in a row of this elite fantasy production, which we haven't gotten from CeeDee Lamb. This past season was... <clears throat> Really his first truly elite fantasy season. And then with Amon Ra, I think he's kind of like Cooper Cup, but just uh, he's not catching passes for Matthew Stafford. He improved his average depth of target this past year, which was exciting. His efficiency stats out wide improved significantly from 2022 to 2023. Not that we necessarily want him always running out wide, but it just shows that in general, Amon Ra is, an, is a receiver on the rise with his skill set. So I, I think in terms of, I actually think crazy as it sounds, Amonra is still just safer than CD Lamb based on what we've seen. So maybe if we want to have some fun, we can go Hill for the upside, then Amonra, then Lamb. Guys, it's not even like I hate Lamb. We're still thinking he's a mid first round pick in this exercise, but it's we're we're really working off of one season, which was truly elite, but it came in a year where Brandon Cooks is old. He was injured for a lot of the season. Dak Prescott just uh really let the ball loose because Tony Pollard wasn't what we expected. I think they're going to shore up running back this offseason and that there's going to be a lot more running back touches next season, which would hurt Lamb. So, uh, yeah, I think the fun way to do this would be Hill, Amon Ra, and then Lamb goes from the 102 to the 107. Okay, so I'm I'm with you. I would probably, if it was just me doing this by myself, yeah, I'd, probably have Lamb, I'd probably have Lamb here and then Hill, then Amon Ra, but... I'm okay here because again, it's a it's a tier. But I'll I'll say the one thing that Josh brought up was, you know, they're talking about different running backs in Dallas, and there has been a lot of reports on Dallas in order to avoid like any like there's all the Derrick Henry reports. Like I think that would be an incredible thing for you know for our content and all that. But I think the most likely scenario for Dallas is they're going to to draft a running back. They view this as a cost saving uh, a met, uh, method. They're not going to have to dive into some big free agent contract. They're not going to have to, you know, extend Pollard. They're going to have a new young running back that's going to cost them little. And I worry a little bit, Josh, because you start hearing about Dallas wants to draft somebody and Mike McCarthy and Schottenheimer in these offseason meetings, like post bye week, they went nuts on the passing volume. Dak put up numbers. CeeDee Lamb put up numbers. Jake Ferguson put up numbers. But deep down in Mike McCarthy's heart, maybe he thinks, we didn't win the playoff game because we couldn't run the football effectively. I don't know. I, I worry about that. I think that's his MO, that's his MO is he's just wants to get back to the old school approach. Maybe lamb. We've seen his best season ever. Um, we don't want to chase last year's points. So I think we'll leave it at this. So right now we're at the one Oh eight McCaffrey chase, Jefferson hall, Tyree kill. I'm on Ross St. Brown, CD lamb. They've been selected. Now we get here to the one Oh eight. And this one's interesting. Um, and I will bring up Bijan Robinson. Bijan is right now the 108. Billy Muzio, uh, the three of us, Billy and Josh and I, we did a, an exercise sort of like this a few weeks back on First Class Fantasy. And at the time, we did not have any clarity on Atlanta's head coach. We did not have any clarity on Atlanta's offensive coordinator. We still don't have clarity on the quarterback, but we do know that the offensive coordinator is Zach Robinson coming from the Sean McVay tree. By all accounts, he is a rational man. He is not a lunatic like Arthur Smith. <laughs> and I think that we 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 have seen these Arthur we've seen the Sean McVay disciples come in and just have a little bit of like rational thinking, you know. So, like if I'm a rational person and I'm, I'm an offensive coordinator, I take a look at B, uh, B. John Robinson and I say, This guy is gonna get unbelievable volume. He's gonna get carries, he's gonna get all the goal line work. And he's also going to be peppered with targets. The underdog community is getting sharper and sharper, Josh. The, like they pushed him up to 108. 
Are you there? Are you ready to click the button on Bijan or is there somebody else you want to stand for? We can click the button on Bijan. Everyone at this point knows most Bijan stats. I'm not going to give people stats that they've heard before. This one, maybe they haven't really heard before. Uh, Bijan Robinson, we're going to take out that headache game. And you might be like, Josh, you can't take out the headache game. That was a headache for me as a fantasy owner. All right, all right, all right. We're going to take out the headache game. You'll, But you'll see where I'm going with this. In the 16 non-headache games. So these are games where Bijan Robinson is healthy. He does not have a headache. He averaged 1.4 red zone carries per game, 0.2 goal line carries per game in those same 16 games where Bijan is healthy. Algier did not average 1.4 red zone carries per game. Tyler Algier averaged 1.8. Bijan averaged 0.2 goal line carries per game. Tyler Algier at 0.4. Tyler Algier was the preferred red zone goal line back in those healthy Bijan Robinson games. I, I think that flips and then some in 2024. I, I'm more than okay with Bijan at the 108. Yeah, I'm there. And I, I think that Bijan like presents a, a really like I feel like 108 is going to kind of be the floor because as soon as we get quarterback news for Atlanta, Bijan's going to tick up a little bit. I'm not sure how high up he'll get, but I think like his floor is going to be like the 108, 109. It's hard to imagine a scenario where drafters are not more excited about Bijan. Once we have clarity on the quarterback, I'll say this, like what, what's the worst possible starting quarterback that you can imagine for Bijan Robinson? Like everything falls apart. And his quarterback is, I'll throw him out, Jacoby Brissett. Is he stay at the 108? Yeah, I don't see why he would fall from there. Okay. Yeah, I think it's going to be, I think the worst case scenario, but also most likely could be like a Jacoby Brissett. I think Justin Fields is a good candidate for the Falcons with the Georgia connections. The fact that he's a similar enough style of quarterback to what they've had. I wouldn't say Fields is really good for a fantasy running back. But again, all these guys should at the very least be upgrades over Desmond Ritter. Yeah, there's there's no one out there. Like the only one that really wouldn't get me excited would be a Ryan Tannehill placeholder where they don't want to use their they – they're going to try to trade up for a quarterback. They're going to try to sign somebody. It's going to all fall apart. Maybe they draft some guy in the second round. Maybe they 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 trade up and get J.J. McCarthy in the like the 20th pick, and they, they sit him for a year, and they have Ryan Tannehill. Like Tannehill, Brissett, even those guys are better than Ritter. So I'm, I'm, I'm okay here. We're, we're at the 109. And Josh, fundamentally, can we take like right now? Puka Nakua is is steamed up. He's at the at the like so goes somewhere nine or ten in all these underdog drafts. But fundamentally, I just cannot take Puka Nakua ahead of Jameer Gibbs, and I really don't feel comfortable taking him ahead of AJ Brown in terms of the ceiling outcome. Am I incorrect here? So I I would take Gibbs. <clears throat> I take Gibbs ahead of Puka. I think with Gibbs, he's got the speed, the pass catching. He was able to get some red zone, some goal line touches during the the second half of the season. It's an offense we like, an offensive line we like. I would actually go Puka ahead of A.J. Brown. The the way that I see it is with A.J. Brown, I struggle to see how he has this truly, truly difference-making fantasy season. He was the wide receiver eight in fantasy points per game back-to-back years. The, the Eagles' pass defense probably gets a little bit better in 2024. Just the natural regression of when you're bottom three unit one year, you're probably not going to be bottom three the next year. And I, I was a little bit concerned at times with Jalen Hurts as a passer. He still has a play style that's not conducive to health. Something could happen to Hurts. That'd be bad for A.J. Brown. We also saw Dallas Goddard missing significant time this past season, which probably helped A.J. Brown as well. So... For for me, I can see Puka having this crazy season, sort of like what Cooper Cup did a couple of years ago, just because Puka plays with Matthew Stafford, Cup's getting older. Puka just had the best statistical season of all time for a rookie. So I, I think there's more unknowns there. I think Puka's a little scary because it's Puka. And I think we both agree that talent is nowhere close to A.J. Brown. But I think once you start to look at the situation and what A.J. Brown's done year after year, A.J. Brown definitely the safer pick. But I think for winning a tournament, I still think there's probably more upside with a Puka. So devil's advocate is we've seen A.J. Brown back-to-back seasons in Philly reaching that 17-point-per-game, 18-point-per-game mark, a, a very, very impactful number. In Kellen Moore's first year there, could we see something stylistically where 
AJ Brown takes that next step, which once you reach that level of fantasy, like it's really hard to say next steps, but I'll say that could it be a perfect storm season where AJ Brown leads the NFL in touchdown receptions in an efficient Kellen Moore offense, which has good tempo and they're, they're taking shots downfield. I don't know. That's my only thing about a- like AJ Brown right now. I feel like people mm-hmm. look at as like a purgatory player. I know I've selected him at like the, the one, two turn a few times and you never feel dangerous. It just feels sort of correct. Um, so I'll leave that. I'll leave that one alone. I want to, before we click the button on Puka, let's take Jameer Gibbs. Cause we both like him here. And then before we click the button on Puka, what about Garrett Wilson? Because we bring up Brees Hall. We talk about Josh, you know, we're talking about Garrett Wilson. We're talking about top 10 pick. We're talking about the offensive rookie of the year, two seasons ago, this, this past off season, With Aaron Rodgers, we were steaming Garrett Wilson up into the first round in August and September drafts. He was going right next to AJ, right next to Amon Ross St. Brown, and people felt really dangerous uh, with their builds when they had him. Then all of a sudden, Aaron Rodgers lost for the season, and that's all she wrote. But you are a big Garrett Wilson guy. Are you still Puka over Garrett Wilson? No, I'd have Garrett Wilson at the top here. The, The parallel I would make is, I think the 2023 CD Lamb season, the one of the best candidates for it would be Garrett Wilson this next year. That's kind of how I'm viewing it. Just not, not a lot of target competition, a player that's insanely talented. I think Garrett Wilson in some ways is actually better than CD lamb as a, just a a player. So uh, motivated, angry Aaron Rodgers with uh, a top five receiver talent. I'm, I'm very excited about that. So I think I'd actually go Garrett Wilson first, just what we saw with the target volume with how he gets open at will. I don't think anyone that's watching those Jets games would say anything other than Garrett Wilson is one of the NFL's absolutely best wide receivers. Whereas there were definitely some games the past few seasons where you'd look at Lamb and go, you know what? He leaves a little bit to be desired at times. And I just think with Garrett Wilson, I've never really seen him have games like that where he just seems to completely disappear in terms of being able to get open. And uh, yeah, him with him with Aaron Rodgers, let, let's get two Jets in that first round. Yeah, and like he could go full on Devonte Adams with Aaron Rodgers, and we talk about like Matt Kelly, the Podfather, hates the term positive touchdown regression. Are you someone who likes the term positive touchdown regression, Josh? Because we've reached the off season, so it's officially time to start throwing that out there in the fantasy football vernacular. Do you think that's an appropriate term to use? Do you have another term you like to use? Yeah, we. I I don't. I switch up what terms I use. Uh, sorry, Matt. Yeah, I think I think this is an acceptable term for Garrett. Thank Wilson. you, thank you, Josh. So now, now, <laughs> uh, you know. Sorry, sorry, Matt. Sorry, Matt. Um, so we'll go Garrett Wilson there because he excites me more than Puka. So now we're back to Puka versus AJ Brown. We'll you go know. AJ Brown for you. You've been making okay. Theo. You've made some concessions in this show already. Put 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 AJ Brown ahead of uh, Puka Nakua. We'll we'll make Puka the the consensus pick that falls here. Okay, so just to recap our draft so far, I appreciate the capitulation on on Puka and AJ. We got Christian McCaffrey. This is our basically our first round. Christian McCaffrey, Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson, Brees Hall, Tyreek Hill, Amon Ross St. Brown, CeeDee Lamb, Bijan Robinson, Jameer Gibbs, Garrett Wilson, AJ Brown, Puka Nakua. Okay, so that's we're pretty chalky. We're gonna go into the second round after we take a quick break and this is going to be, you know, this is a lot more wide open. We can go a lot crazier here, Josh. Uh, We'll be right back. And uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. Hey, we're all starting new fantasy leagues all the time. And more often than not, where do we start our fantasy leagues at player profiler on sleeper? Because it's the best. You can imagine my excitement when I saw sleeper rolled out, Slaper picks, baby. And game stacking is the path to positive returns with these pick'em games. Find that sneaky shootout and set most of the players to go over their projection for that week. Or you find a game going to get dragged into the mud and take every member of the passing game for less than their projections that week. And if you pick up to eight, that's how you 100x your payout on Slaper. It's called the Hail Mary. So if you use promo code UNDERWORLD, you get a $100 instant deposit match. Check out Sleeper's terms and conditions for details. These Sleeper picks are live in over 25 states. Yeah, buddy. Welcome back to Press Coverage. I'm Theo Greminger with Josh Larkey. 
Uh, we are one round in for setting our 2024 redraft ADP. Uh, Josh, so right now, the second round is like the wild, wild west. There's a couple guys that make sense, and there's a couple guys that have just got steamed up extremely highly. Before we discuss Kyron Williams and Jonathan Taylor, I would first like to discuss where Nico Collins is going. Right now, Nico Collins is being drafted as wide receiver nine. We talked about Puka Nakua, but besides Puka Nakua, no player, uh, Kyron Williams, but besides Kyron Williams and Puka Nakua, no player has gained more underdog value in one year than Nico Collins. He is an astronaut right now. The guy is being drafted ahead of so many wide receivers that have performed, uh, you know, at a high level for their career. Where are you at with Nico Collins? Is this correct? Is the steam accurate or should this be avoided? It's definitely a little rich at wide receiver nine. I'm not going to fully fade him. I just like this Houston offense too much, but I, I think there's a chance tank Dell whenever healthy as the wide receiver one there, yes. they might add someone via the draft or free agency as well. We have to remember that going into last year, none of us, none of us were like, guys, this Texans offense is going to be dangerous. They've got Nico Collins. They've got tank Dell. They've got CJ Stroud. That's not what the conversation was. It was, Oh boy. CJ Stroud, probably not going to be a big fantasy guy in year one, given those weapons. So I, I think there's a real chance that they add someone to that room. Not that they'd see how well Collins and Dell played and say, oh, uh, we're now we're going to stay pat. I think there's just not that much invested in them draft capital wise. They're, they're both third round picks in the NFL draft. Collins, uh, to his, his credit, was a low end fantasy wide receiver one in 2023, despite leaving a couple games early with injuries, despite Stroud having injuries in a couple games. So, I, I understand why people would be super optimistic and put him at wide receiver nine little rich for me, but I, I wouldn't fully fade him at this point. Yeah, it's, it's very rich for me. And I like he finished as a wide receiver one, but it was after tank Dell went down and the way tank Dell was headed. It could have very well been tank Dell finishing as a wide receiver one yes. as a rookie. And the whole argument about age versus age, like, Age matters where if they're the same age in the NFL, but what matters more to me is like the NFL experience where, you know, Nico Collins, it took him three years to get acclimated and really get to this type type of level in fantasy. And certainly the upgraded quarterback was massive. I'm not discounting that. Um, but Tank Dell did it right out the gate. So I don't know. I'm not, I'm not there with Nico. But before we go, Nico, let's talk about the three running backs because Kyron Williams and Jonathan Taylor are sort of in their own little tier here. They're right next to one another. Kyron, of course, had multiple 30-point games last year. Uh, extremely polarizing guy in the fantasy community and the dynasty community uh, because the sample size is small. The draft capital was not there for him. We've sort of seen this story before, Josh, and it's frightening what could happen to guys with this sort of profile. James Robinson rings a bell here. I tend to think that this is kind of appropriately pricing for Kyron Williams. There's others who just do not want any part of him. Where are you at on Kyron Williams right now? I think his ADP is fine. I, I don't understand people that are terrified of him. I see that he's ranked above Jonathan Taylor. That is how I would have it. Kyron Williams had the McCaffrey workload this past year. 19 carries a game, four targets a game, 113 total yards per game. One thing that I like to talk about is that stamina is a real thing for athletes. There were a lot of people out there that thought Tony Pollard would crush in a role that he hadn't had before. It was possible, but it turned out, and what I think was probably the most likely outcome is that guy who has never had a crazy workload cannot hold up to crazy workload. We we see we saw it with uh, players year after year where they, they have a, a small sample size efficiency and then it expands and it just really doesn't go well for them. I think that's why Jalen Warren, I think, is a great player. I, I think if he was to get 70% more carries per game and turn into Najee Harris, his efficiency would probably drop significantly. So Kyron Williams, on 23 opportunities per game, the four targets, the 19 carries, with that huge workload at only 200 pounds, oh, he was seventh in next-gen stats, rush yards over expected per attempt. Despite having a ridiculous CMC-type workload, Per touch, he was still really efficient. I don't know how the Rams see that and go, we don't want this guy anymore. Let's let's take away his role. There's obviously injury concerns. He's small. He did get hurt last year. But I, I think the, the positive here is how many running backs out there can have that type of workload 
and still be super efficient. I I think Kyron Williams should be the the guy to start this this round two. And I wouldn't hate people making the case for him to be the the 110, 111 type. Since I think if we knew that he was going to get the same workload that he did last year, he'd go as like the 103, 104 in drafts. And I'll say this. I'll say that maybe they are a little more comfortable with him and they have a more diverse route tree for him because his MO out of college was this guy that's going to get peppered with targets. We have saw a couple games where he had like six targets, but we didn't see them consistently. And maybe that's the way to keep him fresh is to use him as a receiver out of the backfield more. Uh, certainly, you know, there's going to be like, he can't keep up the, the pace of efficiency around the goal line. Like there's going to be some, you know, regression there. But I think in terms of the receiving, it could go up. So I think he's fine. So we're off of Kyron. Kyron's off the board. We're 13 picks in. Before we talk about Jonathan Taylor, we've talked about Nico Collins. DJ Moore. DJ Moore, this sort of feels like AJ Brown last year a little bit where he has this massive year. He moves up in ADP. People want to poke holes. I don't know if that's correct. The quarterback should improve. It, it's either going to be Justin Fields with more experience or it's going to be Caleb Williams, who I think could be dynamite for DJ Moore. There's a chance there could be uh, there could be significantly more target competition. But at the end of the day, I, I, if they're going to take Caleb Williams, do they they hit the button again at receiver for their pick at like at the ninth pick? They could. It could be like Roma Dunze there with Caleb Williams and DJ Moore. But at the end of the day, DJ Moore is still going to lead that team in targets. Where are you at on DJ Moore? Uh, this is about as high as we've ever seen him drafted. That looks fine to me. Uh, okay. He was he was probably overly efficient last year. <laughs> That's going to come down, but I think QB play should improve. And I'm not too concerned about target competition. I, I think DJ Moore is good enough uh, that – he he's the wide receiver one no matter who is there so at least right now i'm not concerned about target competition i think a lot of factors kind of balance each other out and we we can just we can just keep him somewhere in the second round i i have no issues with that okay my guy devon a chain right here going you know right below those two wide receivers and the two running backs we talked about uh i think it's appropriate but i would make a case that that he has the highest upside of any player in the second round we saw him average north of 17 points per game as a rookie. Uh, we saw the incredible spike week potential. And he did that at the same time as Raheem Mostert having this incredible top five season with all these rushing touchdowns. If Mostert comes back down to earth, it probably means A-Chain goes to the moon next year. I love taking him in the second round right now. Josh, either agree with me or talk me off of this one. Yeah, me too. I, I think the you have to start moving some players down. I think we can move Nico Collins down a little bit. I think we can move Jonathan Taylor down a little bit. He's not a big pass catcher. Anthony Richardson probably vultures some touchdowns at the goal line from him. With A-Chan, he played at least 25 snaps in nine games. In those nine games, he averaged 11 carries, 88 rushing yards, 3.9 targets per game, 21 receiving yards, 1.2 touchdowns per game. That was 21 PPR fantasy points a game. Only McCaffrey and Kyron Williams had more. Raheem Mostert turns 32 years old in April. And like you mentioned, Raheem Mostert scored 21 total touchdowns this past season. I, I think it's pretty easy for me to see how A-Chan smashes. And he's kind of uh, like Gibbs in a sense where we don't even need him to have a crazy amount of touches per game for him to still be a fantasy RB1. But we know that these guys are capable of getting 20, 25 touches in a game. And then they can easily be the RB one on the week by four or five, six fantasy points. So I just, I just threw him in there. So we're at pick 15. We could go with one of the players we discussed like DJ Moore, uh, or we could keep going down the list. I'll say Jonathan Taylor. I, I don't know. I don't feel dangerous with Jonathan Taylor here. I think his uh, receiving upside severely lacks with Anthony Richardson there. Uh, I think that Michael Pittman will still see targets. It's just going to be, they're going to franchise tag him or they're going to extend him. Michael Pittman is a target earner. They're going to figure out a way to target him. After that, I think it's a run heavy offense where Taylor's going to be fine. But I don't think like if I'm drafting a guy here at the running back spot, I want him to finish in the top like two or three, at the, uh, you know, at the position where, you know, I can see that with a chain. I can see it with Williams. I don't with Taylor. Where are you at with Taylor? That's, I, I feel similarly. Okay. I, so, I would take him mid to later second round right now is I think where he should be going. So I think he's a few spots uh, too expensive. So 15 overall here, 
DJ Moore, or do you want to make a case for somebody a little lower down the list? I uh, oh man, I don't have too many. Strong I mean, it's going to be the, it's going to be Marvin the... Harris, Marvin Harrison Jr. Uh, when once he lands, we're gonna we're gonna want to take him here. Um, but that would be like a little spicy. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll just make the case for Rasheed Rice. Okay. Uh, he was a full time player week fourteen onward this year. He broke out in week twelve. If we look at week twelve onward through the four playoff games when he's facing some pretty good defenses, that's a ten game sample. That ten game sample. The 17 game pace of that 10 game sample would be 151 targets, 117 catches, 1,326 yards. He plays with Patrick Mahomes. Travis Kelsey turns 35 in October. I I can see a path to uh, Rishi Rice just being a, a true difference maker where he looks like a round one fantasy receiver. And I think the floor is awesome. Again, yeah. you, you can't really luck into what he just did. And he plays with Patrick Mahomes. That's going to be the, the best situation ever. Because even if they bring in another receiver there, he's still starting in two receiver sets. He still has that rapport. And we know that Kelsey is on the decline. He just looks slower out there. And I, I'm just, it's tough for me to uh, be told that the 35 year old tight end who already declined as a 34 year old is the reason Rice won't hit. Okay. So let's go DJ Moore and le- then let's go Rishi Rice. Uh, let's get those two off the board. Nice. Do you agree on that one? Let's do it. Okay, let's do it. So we got DJ Moore. We got Rasheed Rice. Okay, so now we're a little bit more galaxy-brained in. Uh, How can we not take Marvin Harrison Jr. at this point? The guy's going to be a top five pick. There's not a scenario where he falls where I'm not, like, extremely excited. Arizona, I would be very, very excited. The Chargers, I mean, despite the fact that it's uh, it's Greg Roman and it doesn't seem like it's going to be so wide open, I think Harrison Jr. with elite quarterback play like Herbert would go nuts. And then the New England Patriots, where people bring up New England. If he's drafted by New England, I could see 155, 160 targets his rookie season, and that's the complete offense. But that's the new offense. I know it's Alex Van Pelt. I know it's not like somebody that people are getting excited about. But there is no competition there. Like people bring up New England as a horrible landing spot for him. I don't know, Josh. I'm on the, I think like, you know, targets are targets kind of deal. And with a player that talented, he's going to put up fantasy points if he sees that sort of volume. So uh, where are you at on this one? I, I think I'd take Jonathan Taylor over Marvin Harrison. I, I do think he, he he probably finishes as a lower end fantasy wide receiver one. But uh, I, I do have a tough time seeing how his ADP rises from this spot, but I can see how it falls. I think he's kind of priced in like he's going to Arizona or Los Angeles right now is how I'm seeing it at ADP 19.8. So there's where I like game theory. I I don't see him falling because I think once we see these rookies reach like this sort of level in drafts, whether it's, uh, you know, underdog or whether it's FFPC or NFFC, we rarely see rookies rise and then fall. Like it's Jonathan Taylor would be the one. Jonathan Taylor like steamed up and then steamed back a little bit. There's been like Najee Harris steamed up, uh, Jamar Chase steamed up. Uh, We saw last year Jackson Smith and Jigba just kept going up and up and up. And I know we're talking about the sixth round for for JSN or the fifth round in underdog and not the second round. But at the same time, like he had DK Metcalf, he had Tyler Lockett next to him, and he still kept gaining value in these drafts. So. I think once the rookies, once the market moves on the rookies, Mm -hmm. they don't go back. So I don't know. Uh, But we're okay. Taylor's in there. Make a case for somebody else over Marvin Harrison Jr. that's still on the board then. Uh, I mean, at this point, I just, we we can go Marvin Harrison. Yeah, we'll we'll throw him in there. I I have fewer takes at this point. Like I'd probably go Marvin Harrison, then get Nico Collins in there. Uh, Yeah, I, I start to, I start to think this, this section looks pretty good. Uh, the, I think the reason Josh Allen separated from everyone else is that he's had at least 24 fantasy points per game in four straight games or four straight seasons. Nobody else is even close to that. So I think it makes sense that he's there. The, the one guy that does concern me a little bit though, would just be Debo Samuel. Yeah. Debo Samuel is not quite the, the route runner and the guy that can win in all scenarios. He wins by getting scheme touches. Scheme touches are a ton of fantasy points per touch. I understand that, but the, the way that he plays it's conducive to getting injured. I I think anyone that watches Debo Samuel sees how he invites contact. 
this Niners offense was so unbelievably ridiculously efficient. Brock Purdy leading the NFL in touchdown pass rate, leading the NFL in yards per attempt. And Debo is still just a low end fantasy wide receiver one. I, I think Ayuk at this point is just significantly better as a pure receiver. George Kittle is still at the top of his game. They still have Christian McCaffrey. And I, I think this offense just gets a little bit less efficient next year and that this would hurt the guy getting schemed touches in Debo Samuel the most. So I love Ayuk here. Um, I, I, I like your take on Josh Allen. I just wonder if, like, do you think that there's going to be this much of a, of a gap between Josh Allen and quarterback two when we get to like August? Right now he's about 17 spots ahead of Jalen Hurts. Uh, and even more when when you get to almost two rounds gap between him and like Mahomes Jackson. I know you bring up the consistent scoring, but it's more of a take on it's more of a take of the position as a whole. Will it be a little more clustered like we saw last year? I don't know. I'm not sure, but I do think Allen belongs in the second round. So I'll let you make this next pick. We'll go. It's I, I think Ayuk. I think Allen. You know, if you're fading Samuel, I think Ayuk becomes even stronger. And then, Josh, before we put the pick in, talk about Saquon Barkley because he could be a free agent. This could be a guy that gains a lot of value. Let's say Saquon lands in Houston. Where is he being drafted? Yeah, Saquon's an interesting one. I struggle with some takes on him. I think I would just go, Hmm. I think I'd go Collins, Ayuk, Allen for these next three. And I'd go Collins over Ayuk simply because I think the Texans pass a lot more. And that's really the only take there in terms of why. With Saquon, I, I think he's fine. I could see him gaining a ton of ADP value if he goes somewhere like Houston. I could also see teams looking at a running back in his late 20s who's been questionably efficient at times with a long injury history and saying, this looks like a committee back. And I, I, I think that's actually a very likely outcome in many ways. Maybe Saquon tries to go somewhere where that isn't the case, but I think most smart teams will not actually view Saquon Barkley as a 20 touch per game running back or a 25 touch per game running back like he's been at times in New York. I, I just think he's going to want to go to a contender and the contender's going to want to make sure that he is fresh and ready for the playoffs. So I, I don't actually think Hey, I think it's more likely that he's getting 15 touches a game than 20 next year. So I don't know. I think that the, like he's had back-to-back seasons of, of 10 touchdowns. Um, and I think that, you know, some other team like devil's advocate could be another team says, we're going to target Saquon a little bit more. This is a guy that could really help our quarterback, whoever it is as a safety valve out of the backfield. Saquon's been in like the forties in terms of his reception totals. Uh, with Dable the last two years, maybe he gets back up closer to 60 receptions, gives him a little more juice. It's just sort of a uh, a scarcity thing. So maybe the move would be to push Travis Etienne up. He's a very tough player to price uh, because a lot of things went very well for him last year. But he's being drafted at 31 overall. Uh, and I think structurally he makes a lot of sense, whether it's redraft or best ball. Because I think that he does offer you some pretty, you know, you know, top five ceiling, but he seems like a guy that's going to finish as an RB1 and you get that here. Where are you at on ETN? Yeah, I think if I had to, if I was, if I had to do one draft and there was no ADP, I, I think ETN and Jonathan Taylor look pretty similar, maybe even the edge to ETN. So yeah, I, I don't think you need to take him at a crazy spot because his ADP is in the 30s. But right now, if I had to choose one draft, I would prefer ETN to Saquon straight up just because right, right now ETN's in a good offense. Things should improve efficiency-wise. He got the pass catching this past season. He is the, the, the red zone and the goal line back. That is not Tank Bigsby like some people thought. It is Travis ETN. He's the best running back on that team. I, I think there's just very, very few concerns. I, I think we all would agree that ETN's good. I think we'd all agree that ETN has a, a better chance to be a workhorse running back on a good offense than Saquon, just because at this point with Saquon, we don't know where he's going to be. And we also don't know how the NFL views him. I think the fantasy community thinks Saquon is a lot better than the NFL does. And I think that's why like he wasn't really getting paid. And when you look, he's just really, really inefficient. Uh, he's been scoring a ton of fantasy points. We do like that for fantasy, but it's going to be a new situation, a new team. And that, that often concerns me when a team isn't, clamoring to bring a guy back 
that makes me start to question his talent. The Giants do not seem like they think Saquon Barkley is this crazy difference maker that they have to have next year. So, Josh, we're we're 22 players in. Um, we I just put in Travis Etienne because I I think we're kind of both there. It's it's not a, a one we're excited about, but I think we can both paint a picture for him here in the end of the second round. Again, you don't have to reach for him in underdog drafts because he's going 31, but we we pushed him up to 22. Who would be your next player off the board? Right now, you know, we talked about Debo, Saquon. The next few guys at ADP are Diggs, Adams, Alave, Tank Dell, Sam Laporta, Michael Pittman Jr. Do any of those excite you or should we keep going down the board? Uh, I think we go Saquon here. I liked your your upside case. If he goes to Houston and the next thing you know, he's way up. The the guy that I would look at would just be Chris Olave. He's still okay. super young. He he gets all the targets. He gets all the air yards. Derek Carr had that uh, injury early in the season. What was it? The AC joint sprain, I believe. And there were actually several games that were impacted by it where he was still playing, but it was clear that he was diminished. His air yards per attempt would be like four. And Olave wouldn't do much. And it's like, yeah, when you're a downfield receiver and your quarterback has some kind of shoulder injury, that would actually make sense that it would affect you negatively. So I think with Chris Olave, we've got a super, super young receiver who's been nothing but awesome in his short NFL career in terms of actually being an NFL player. He has not been awesome with fantasy points, and I don't think we should look at the fantasy points there because it's a downfield speedy receiver who's going to have uh, the first quarterback continuity of his career, getting Derek Carr again, most likely. And I love that you said quarterback continuity because I think that we beat up Derek Carr a lot in the in like the fantasy community. Uh, and certainly in the NFL community, there's not like a whole lot of Derek Carr stands. But for a young receiver to just simply have the same quarterback for back-to-back seasons, I think that matters. Um, and we did see Devontae Adams put up a huge number with Derek Carr. We have seen Darren Waller finish top three at his position, was used as a de facto wide, re- uh, wide receiver two seasons with Derek Carr. So we've seen elite production with Derek Carr. That could be the case this year. So we have pushed down a few guys and we have pushed up a few guys. I'm going to rip through the top 24. Christian McCaffrey, Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson, Brees Hall, Tyree Kill, Amon Ross St. Brown, C.D. Lamb, B. John Robinson, Jameer Gibbs, Garrett Wilson, A.J. Brown, Puka Nakua. Then our second round was Kyron Williams, Devon A. Chain, DJ Moore, Rashi Rice, Jonathan Taylor, Marvin Harrison Jr. Josh finally gave in and let us take Marvin Harrison Jr. there. Then Nico <laughs> Collins, we capitulated, we took some Nico Collins, unexciting. Brandon Ayuk, Josh Allen, Travis Etienne, and Saquon Barkley. Josh, we've established our top 24, and I want to dive into three guys. Uh, very quickly, Tajay Spears is currently the running back 18. Uh, right now, Tajay is going ahead of, it's kind of wild. Tajay Spears is basically going ahead of every old running back who's had a successful season. And I say that loosely, but Nick Chubb, David Montgomery, Ramondre Stevenson, Austin Eckler, Tony Pollard, Joe Mixon, James Conner, Najee Harris, all the guys that you don't want to draft because the whole community wants them some Tajay Spears. Running back 18 for Tajay Spears. Is this correct? I think it's all right. I probably won't have too much of him there. We've got some quarterback concerns. I'm not quite sure if the Titans actually want to give him a heavy workload. That's what we talked about earlier. These guys that flash with small sample efficiency at running back, it often does not translate when they get more touches at the NFL level. They might draft somebody. They might bring someone in from with free agency to split work with him. He catches passes. He is good at football. I, I don't think that pick completely burns you in any way. It's just not something that I'm going to do a ton. I think I'm going to probably be taking quarterback and wide receiver in that range. Okay, that makes sense. And speaking of quarterbacks, CJ Stroud, who we're both huge fans of, but now he's going off the board at QB5 overall. Josh, it seems kind of like we're taking CJ Stroud at his fantasy ceiling because the guys in front of him are Josh Allen, Jalen Hurts, Lamar Jackson, and Patrick Mahomes. Three out of those four are, you know, MVP caliber guys with incredible rushing upside. And the fourth is the maybe the greatest quarterback of all time, who's also had a QB1 overall season. None of those guys are old. Uh, I mean, where are we at here? We're CJ Stroud as quarterback five. Like, I get it. Like Anthony Richardson, Joe Burrow, Dak Prescott, Purdy. Uh, like, there's the guys behind him, like, 
I'm probably there, but it's, it's a matter of should Stroud be that much farther ahead than like a Joe Burrow? 20 spots ahead of Joe Burrow, Josh. Yeah, Joe Burrow's never really shown that elite fantasy ceiling. Stroud started to show it at times this past year. I, I kind of think of Stroud as he can be Patrick Mahomes for fantasy, where you're getting a little bit of mobility and you're just getting such insane passing numbers. The, the passing volume was pretty good there throughout most of last season. So I, I think I'm okay with it. I'm not going to draft a ton of him there, but I, I don't think that's the wrong spot. I'll put it like this. I'll definitely have more Anthony Richardson at quarterback six in my portfolio than Stroud, but I don't necessarily think that it's dumb for Stroud to go ahead of Richardson when, yeah, Richardson has a crazy upside, but he's going to have to change his play style. The guy got hurt three times in parts of four games, missed most of his rookie season due to injury. So I, I think it, it makes sense why, why Stroud would kind of be there. I think he's the, I'd say he's the better version of Joe Burrow for fantasy and he might be as good as Patrick Mahomes. So I, I think he's fine there. Yeah. I, I think I'd rather take Stroud in the fifties than Tajay Spears at RB 18, just because I could see Stroud having those quarterback one overall weeks where he wins you that week. It's a little harder for me to see Spears being the RB one multiple weeks in 2024. And 35 spots ahead of Herbert and Love. I mean, it's a whole, like, we'll have the whole offseason to talk about the quarterback spot. But quickly, I want to discuss a tight end. Because that the tight end spot on underdog, and again, it's half point PPR in, in the underdog streets. But I think it's a good indication of kind of where redraft is going. When they first started drafting, Trey McBride was tight end seven. And there was a massive correction where Trey McBride is now steamed up to tight end three. So he started out right behind Dalton Kincaid. Dalton Kincaid, he passed. Then he passed George Kittle. But now he's passed Mark Andrews. So the tight end rankings are now Sam Laporta, who goes significantly higher than everyone, and for good reason. He's a stud, and he's young. Travis Kelsey is still going at 41. And then Trey McBride and Mark Andrews are in their same little mini tier. But Trey McBride now is four spots of ADP ahead of Mark Andrews, and it seems to be climbing. He seems like he's going to end up maybe inside the fourth round shortly. Is this correct? Where Mark Andrews, where we've seen him be a tight end one overall, and last year was giving you tight end one overall type production before his injury, is now being passed by by Trey McBride. Where are you at on this one, Josh? I'll take McBride. He took over full time tight end duties from Zach Ertz when he got hurt week eight onward. It's about a 10 game sample. Eight and a half targets, six and a half catches, 66 yards. Would have been the tight end one in PPR fantasy points per game. Wouldn't quite be there in half PPR, but I think PPR is interesting because it kind of shows that in terms of usage, in many ways, McBride was just the best usage tight end once he became a starter. He's got round two draft capital. He's fast. He won the Mackey Award for best tight end in college. I, I think all the signs are that he's really, really good at playing tight end. He's really, really good at earning targets. There's going to be Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors. Someone like that will be there in Arizona to make sure that he's not just getting swarmed by defenders. And when we have a good quarterback in Kyler Murray as the, the engine of that offense, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about McBride. Mark Andrews has one season in his career where he hit 900 receiving yards. That's a combination of injuries, him just not simply being quite as dynamic of an athlete as some of the other tight ends, and then Lamar Jackson just not passing as much. So I... I'll just take the younger guy and McBride, and I think that's how it should be. Give me three guys that you are much higher on than their current ADP on underdog. We'll take Austin Eckler first, ADP 75, running back 22. Free agent chooses his destination. The, the pass catching can be dependent on game scripted times, which is kind of what we might want for best ball, get those spike weeks. Most likely outcome, he probably just stays with the Chargers the Chiefs, the Bengals, the Texans. There's a lot of attractive destinations out there. And we have to remember that he had the high ankle sprain early in 2023. Kyler Murray, ADP 92, quarterback 13. Coming off the ACL tear, he had five and a half rush attempts per game last year. That was the lowest of his career, but he had average 6.7 per game prior to that. So the downtick was slight. I think it rebounds. Supporting cast was decimated. Just Trey McBride. Hollywood Brown was injured for pretty much every game. I, I don't think anyone else there on that roster was a, a good starting receiver. I think, like I mentioned before, Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors enters there. Arizona's defense should be bad once again. This is going to be the, the one of the two or three premier shootout teams. I think he should probably go in the 60s or 70s. He's been the quarterback three, quarterback four, quarterback seven, and then last year the quarterback eight in fantasy points per game. 
Again, going at quarterback 13. And then the last one, we'll talk about a rookie, Tra- Troy Franklin, ADP 113, wide receiver 51. NFL mock draft database has him as the 34th ranked player overall. The, the most consensus selection in the recent mocks has been pick 28 to Buffalo is the most common place he's been ending up. Three-year player at Oregon, early to clear. Sophomore year, he had two times the receiving yards, two times the touchdowns of anyone else on an Oregon team. Junior year, all he does is have 81 catches for nearly 1,400 yards and 14 touchdowns. I think there's a pretty good chance he goes in the 70s to 90s range for best ball drafts once the NFL draft hits. So at ADP 113, I think there's significant room for him to move up. I love it. And for me, the three guys that I'm higher on than consensus right now are Roma Dunze, and Adunze is not cheap. Adunze is going to cost you like late fifth round capital. He's going 57 overall. But I think like wide receiver 33 for Adunze, uh, like he should be way higher. Uh, this is a guy that could end up potentially being drafted in the top six overall. And I think he's a lock to go inside the top 15. There's certain landing spots where he's going to land as the team's wide receiver one um, and other spots where he could land and he could be a in very advantageous matchups every week. I think Adunze is an absolute stud. Um, and again, he's pushed down because he's the wide receiver three in this class. I think he would have been the wide receiver one in last year's class. And then I love Caleb Williams. I think the market is correct on him, but he's going as quarterback 16, um, which is, it seems expensive, but I would bet on Caleb Williams finishing as a quarterback one next year. Uh, I have no uh, no doubts in my mind that he's going to be a starter day one. We talked about Chicago where he could be passing the ball to DJ Moore, Cole Komet. Uh, And then we talked about, you know, this potential for Washington to trade up where he would be reunited with his college offensive coordinator, or uh, or excuse me, former head coach uh, with Cliff Kingsbury of Arizona, where Mm -hmm. we've seen him, um, you know, put up, you know, consistent tempo. And Cliff Kingsbury, like, was not the greatest fantasy coach, but he did some things that I think translate to fantasy success. Arizona was always in, like, uh, plays per game, they always had consistent tempo. They always passed the ball. And I think there would be opportunities for Caleb Williams to be an opportunistic scrambler as well in that offense. So Williams is going to go top two in the draft. He's going to land well. He's a stud. Just take him. He'll be a quarterback one next year. And James Conner. Josh, you bring up Kyler Murray. James Conner had his first 1,000-yard season last year. James Conner is like completely locked in. This guy seems like a cardinal for, for life. The franchise loves him. And you bring up the fact that the offense is going to be much better in Arizona next year. James Conner, right now, I believe, is being drafted as running back 27. It's Or, excuse me, he's up to running back 25. But I'd still take him over Joe Mixon. i take him over Tony Pollard. i take him over Ramondre Stevenson. i take him over David Montgomery. I would take him over Nick Chubb. So I think he's about five spots uh, too, mm-hmm. too cheap in ADP. Uh, Josh, this was like a ton of fun. We could do this for uh, for about an hour more. Uh, but I appreciate your time as always let everybody know what you have coming out with the dominator once again. Yeah, you can find me Twitter at J Larky tweets. I'll have some free content there and the dominator most likely will begin towards the end of this week. Uh, I'm going to be talking about my dynasty rankings process. I think it's different from a lot of people and I think how I view dynasty and how I try to group players together and how I use redraft in my dynasty analysis, I think is, uh, a little bit different from a lot of people. So I'll, I'll kind of talk about how I'm different, but how I also try not to ignore consensus and how I try to blend my own process with consensus to figure out where the strategic middle ground is. So that will be coming out very shortly. No, I'm, I'm super stoked. I always enjoy consuming Josh's content. I always enjoy podcasting with you. And I know our audience is going to be really excited to hear you this off season as well. Stick with us here at Press Coverage. We got you covered all off season. We're going to cover free agency. We're going to cover the draft. And we're going to find you the edges you need to win a lot of money and a lot of leagues in 2024. Hey, I want to take a moment to thank you for tuning in. It's important to me that all of our media be free. This is only possible because of you allowing a true independent sports media enterprise to thrive unlike any other in the business. So please subscribe to the All-In Package to continue to make all this possible to ensure that all of our stats, information, data, content is available to you, especially you, the people that get the site and 
get the show.